So I prepared to leave the United States after 36 years and return to Guyana. I began to ask myself, what is it that are the gaps in our university? What is it that we need to do, not only to strengthen the current enterprise, but what is it that we need to do to build for the future? Hi there, Carl Brung here with you. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Let's go into my time tunnel, like, subscribe, and see what's behind there for you. Hi there, Carl Brung here with you. Welcome back to another edition of my YouTube channel and my time tunnel. What's behind here for you? The last time we were looking at the literary side of things. Now I'd like to take a look at the intellectual and educational side of things. And meaning that, um, Professor Ive Law Lloyd Griffith, who is the Vice Chancellor and President of the University of Ghana, recently was here in the United Kingdom and met with the Guyanese diaspora. Now, one of the good things about it is that a number of people were not aware or didn't even know how much and how active the University of Ghana is playing and is, is along with the University of the West Indies, how much they're really working together to keep our youths and our graduates really well um, and ready for the new world, the new era that's coming together. That is, things like... Um, we have the oil exploration coming up in 2020, the whole process of oil and, and what's happening. And what Professor Ivlo Griffith did was bring home to enlighten our, our nationals about how much the University of Ghana is getting itself ready for that era and that time frame. Also looking at whereby what Ghana needs to do with all the changes that are taking place within the agricultural sector, I mean, the sugar industry, how much we can produce and make ourselves much more viable in the new world. But I'll tell you no more. I'll say no more on this. I'll ask you to listen. It, I had to edit this down because it's very, very, very lengthy, but it is educational. And if you really would like to know, I invite you now to listen to that. Let me begin by thanking the High Commission, and I know that High Commission himself is going to be back, but thank the Minister Councillor for that generous introduction. Uh, before I make my remarks, I want to make two observations. The first of which is to say, I hope we're going to drink some of that rum <laughs> there. Can't have good rum only be shelved and look for viewing. And the second thing, that poster behind colleagues sitting there, featured a few weeks ago in a powerful, exemplary manifestation of some of who we are and what we are in Guyana, in that we had a gentleman who I was explaining to Professor Hall, Dave Martins, is now our artist in residence, following Keith Waite. Yes, for well, As our artist in residence. Well. Um, and Dave did a powerful public performance from that same bandstand. I was in New York at the time, but I was delighted to see people from all parts of the world offering their comments from Australia, from parts of South America. And so we intend that the university as part of the renaissance in which we launched to make the arts more visible and supported. And I'm delighted that Keith led the way and we're having Dave Martins this time. And I began conversations last November with the Indian High Commission in Ghana to have the Indian High Commission support because I want to have a diversity of the artists in residence. Um, so the next artist in residence is going to be somebody who can bring to us the Indo Guyanese talent and wealth and culture. It doesn't have to be a musician, it can be a sculptor, it can be a painter, it can be a dancer, but we've got to find a way to make the arts come alive and get the celebration and support that has actually been on the decline for a while. As I prepared to leave the United States after 36 years and return to Guyana, I began to ask myself, what is it that are the gaps 
in our university? What is it that we need to do, not only to strengthen the current enterprise, but what is it that we need to do to build for the future? Mindful of some of the national development projects and projections, mindful also that we are not only Guyana Caribbean, we are Guyana South America, and that in both contexts, Caribbean context and South American context, there are a number of underutilized opportunities. And so as part of my, how might we build the, fill the gaps? How might we build forward? I adopted as a mantra, as a pursuit, something called Project Renaissance. We are in the rebuilding, rebranding the university. And we're doing that in a context of not only asking what the university needs to do by itself, but what is it the university needs to do with the community, not only with government support. And I often ask, what is the name of the person who created history in 1913? For what did he create the history? And where in Ghana might you find a celebration of him? The person is, in non Guyanese, named Rabindranath Tagore. Rabindranath Tagore made history in 1913 in becoming the first non-European to receive the Nobel Prize for Literature. He also made history later on in rejecting the British honor of being Sir Rabindranath Tagore, when he said, I cannot accept your celebration, your honor, because of the way in which you treat Indians in India. And I've used Tagore's Jitangali over the decades, and there's a powerful simple sentence that I've been using since I returned to Guyana as the fulcrum around which the Renaissance project will be driven. And it's Tagore's proposition that says you cannot cross a sea simply by standing and staring at the water. You cannot cross a sea simply by standing and staring at the water. What Stagore was arguing for is that any challenge, any sea that you want to cross, lamentation does not serve the end. You've got to be intentional about how you cross that sea. You either can swim, get a plane, get a submarine, get a boat, but you've got to be intentional about crossing the sea. And so what I have done with the team at the University of Guyana is to start this Renaissance project as an intentional effort to cross the seas that the University of Guyana have been facing as challenges. And one of those seas is a resource sea. University of Ghana has been neglected insofar as funding. One of those C's is what I call an esteem C, the reputational value of the university for a variety of reasons declined. But allied linked to that esteem connected to the resource neglect has been the business of what I call the perspicacity. The University of Ghana, when I was a student here in the 70s, it was an engine of research, it was producing things. It was a place where scholars from other parts of the world came and looked to Guyanese. We have got to reestablish perspicacity. And so the project is how might we cross these seas, resources, esteem, perspicacity. 
We cannot do it simply by lamenting what used to be, lamenting what needs to be. We've got to do something intentionally to be sure that we get the desired part of the other side. And so I've identified four imperatives for us to be able to cross the sea. We've got to have capital investment. And by capital, I'm not talking simply about finance capital. Linked to the finance capital, what is essential for the perspicacity and the esteem is the human capital. One of the realities of Ghana about which we are all quite familiar, and maybe we don't appreciate it as much until you get to Guyana, is that the preponderance of Guyanese talent is not in Guyana. It's not in Guyana. Two weeks after I returned as Vice Chancellor, I hosted a conference. I brought four to five of my friends from around the world, including from the United Kingdom to ask a simple question, how might we leverage the human capital talent of Guyana in the diaspora to make a difference? But ladies and gentlemen, while it is necessary to have the investment in capital, we also have the imperative of academic enhancement. Some things that one takes for granted living in the United Kingdom or living in the United States or even living in Jamaica no longer can be taken for granted in Guyana. It's not only the decline of culture and the arts, standards generally. And so one of my top priorities having gone back in June of 2016 was to regain the accreditation of the School of Medicine that had been lost in 2012. I'm delighted that last year we got that accreditation back. We have to face the reality that our academic quality is not what it used to be. And we've got to do something about it. The academic enhancement, which means how do you manage your curriculum? Are you teaching the same thing that you were taught in postgraduate school 20 or 30 years ago? while the world has moved on. How are you dealing with things as elementary as getting the grades of your students in on time? I had a long battle with the two unions last year when I said I will not sign any salary increase agreement if the agreement doesn't talk about performance and the agreement does not say People who have outstanding grades are not going to get money. You should see the long philosophical arguments and criticism. I said, OK, what philosophy you use when you get your grades in, you're going to get a salary increase. It is so elementary that a vice chancellor should not have to be waging a war about lecturers turning their grades in. And I made the point a few weeks ago I will be having that same intentionality as we do the negotiations for salary increases this year. But it is also imperative for us to move beyond the preponderance of the income coming from the government because I worry about a struggle that needs to be waged and I'm intending to continue waging it. We have got to allow government intrusion in the university to be removed. And people who want to pay the piper often want to do what? Call the children. We have got to diversify the portfolio of revenue so that there is not a strong incentive to want to say, well, you know, I'm paying your bill. And I've been told that since I've been vice chancellor. And so I've said, we have to increase tuition. University of Ghana, as you know, started on the basis of a small tuition. Between 1994, between 1972 and 1994, there was no tuition. It was free. 
And in 1994, when tuition was introduced, it was pegged at 1,000 US dollars. It is no longer tenable to maintain that as the model for tuition when you want to attract better lectures, when you want to fill the labs with adequate equipment, when you want to build the structures, when you want to correct the neglect in so many areas. And so for the first time since 1994, we had a tuition adjustment that says over the three years beginning last year, it'll be 15% for continuing students, 18% for new students in year one, 10% in year two, 10% in year three, as part of an effort to create the viability needed. But I know that even with that percentage adjustment upwards, the university is not going to be able to do what's needed to build. And so I've said to the Caribbean Development Bank, and they've agreed, help us do a costing study. Because once we get to the beginning of year three, we need to start a conversation of what is going to be beyond year three. I would welcome that conversation being guided by empirical evidence, not just estimates. I need to know what does it cost to produce a degree in electrical engineering? What does it cost to one of degrees in health sciences? We just don't know. So we, we're going to have those facts. And I suspect, and I've said this on campus, I'm in, off campus, we're likely to find that we need to be making significant adjustments beyond 10%. But it will create an opportunity for the conversation to be had with the other major, other than student stakeholder, the government, as to how can the government up its subventions but the viability of the economic profile is not sustainable with the current model. Oil and gas is a major national project. The university has to be part of how do we prepare. And that is a project that has been consuming. So let me share with you finally, and I'll take questions or comments. How is it we've been preparing for first oil. First oil, as you know, it is 2020. The architecture for the delivery of an instructional program to meet oil and gas revolves significantly around the engineering the technology, but it is not limited to engineering and technology. And so what I've said is that we need to begin the conversation about evaluating what we have in technology, in engineering. We'll be changing the formal name of the faculty from faculty of technology to faculty of engineering and technology. But we also need to find out what in the allied areas we have and industry nation might need. So we held a consultation with the industry in November of last year, brought together all the major oil companies. And it's not just ExxonMobil. Yes. ExxonMobil is there, Hess is there, Chinese company Nexon are a part of the big project for Lisa One. Tula is there, Total is there, CGX is there, Respal is there. It's a large and growing number of companies. We had most of them there, and government, hear what they think they might need. And what is it we have in those areas? Not just technology engineering. And what might our gaps be as we try to meet the needs in those areas? I brought on board a technical advisor as our first engineering residence in the department, in the faculty of technology. But I also hired two technical advisors from Trinidad, both of whom have not only long academic experience, but industry experience. One has been in the academy, in industry, and in government, serving as a permanent secretary in the Ministry of Energy. So they're helping us to figure out how we might understand what we have, understand what we don't have, and then get 
to discerning what needs to be in practical terms. And one of the things that we know we don't have, partly because of the financial neglect, partly because of the esteem that has lost, we don't have all the instructional and lab capabilities to deliver the programs that are going to be needed. So we've got to build partnerships. We're going to be building partnerships with the University of West Indies, Trinidad and Tobago, as well as the University of Trinidad and Tobago that has a, an entire campus that is called the Energy Campus. All they do is oil and gas. I led a delegation to Trinidad uh, in November. Take a look at their facilities, have a better sense of what in practical terms the gaps are going to be needing to be filled. I sent a delegation to the University of Alberta that has a long history in oil and gas, particularly onshore, developing partnerships with, had a wonderful meeting last night for dinner with Professor Dave Phoenix from London South Bank, has history in engineering, developing partnerships with universities in United States, South Africa, we've got to be able to find the opportunities to make the linkages with people who can deliver some of what is going to be needed. And one of the areas that we're pursuing with as maximum speed as we can muster, we have to have a new Department of Petroleum Engineering in the Faculty of Technology. Right now we offer some petroleum courses as individual courses in a degree program. We have to have a study focused delivery not only on the instructional side, but the supporting labs. So the oil and gas train has left the station, whether you like it or not. But let me end on this note. One of the gaps that I discerned that the University of Guyana needs to do something about as I left New York to go to Guyana has to do with something that is a point of pride in platitudinous terms for our nation. Some of you may have heard for decades, Guyana has the potential to feed the whole Caribbean. Agriculture, we've got some of the requisite elements to feed and feed in a nutritious way, not only Guyana and the Caribbean, but beyond. And my worry, my fear, my apprehension is that as the oil and gas consumes the attention, if we're not careful, we're going to neglect the agriculture. We're going to do the same thing that Trinidad has done and has regretted having to have so much food imported. And so we're pursuing establishing an Institute of Food and Nutrition Security that will allow us to put a spotlight on the gaps. And one of those gaps has to do with research on food crops. One of those gaps has to do with food science that is not studied significantly. You are not going to export your products simply because you think people want them. There are health standards you've got to meet. There are nutrition standards you've got to meet. There are simple things like, or things we allegedly think are simple in some parts of Ghana, as the aesthetics of the packaging. So we've got to do something about how might we ensure, A, the nation does not neglect the agricultural enterprise, and how do we move agriculture to a different level. My final, final point is that part of our ability to tap that market right next door called Venezuela and Brazil requires us to have a linguistic diversity beyond the English language that we are so consumed about. And so in designing the School of Entrepreneurship and Business Innovation, we have two mandatory requirements. Everyone has to have a facility with a language other than English. Everyone has to take a business etiquette dinner. 
And so we've said the languages of choice for the first opportunity are Spanish, Portuguese, and Mandarin. And you've got to take, and you're going to pay for it, I'm not paying for it, a business etiquette dinner. I have seen being a president of a university in the United States, being a dean, being a provost, how helpful or hurtful social skills, the soft skills, the etiquette skills, can be not only for students, but for lecturers. Remember when I first started as a dean in the 90s at Florida International, I started a program that used to be called Dinner with the Dean. My staff would select 20 students from each of the campuses, and we'd have a six-course dinner. I still remember this student a couple of places down from me asking his friend, which fork do I start with? Which fork do I start with? I said I would much prefer to have that question asked and answered before he graduated. The person who led the team said to me, my first <coughs> job after graduating with a PhD, I did not get, and I know why I did not get it. Somebody should have told me at a dinner interview, do not order onion soup. <laughs> he was fighting with the cheese, and everybody at the dinner had cheese on them. We want to be sure that the students have a sense of propriety. And I tested it by inaugurating something called the etiquette training for the student leaders. We had 56 club leaders. I hired Carnegie Home School of Home Economics in a five-day program. And I held closing dinners. Members of my team went. I went to one. And a student said to me, Vice Chancellor, I'm so glad you're doing this thing for us. I never knew that RSVP was not a person. <laughs> I said, you shouldn't feel embarrassed. The idea is for you to know this now. So he's always seen this arm with me. I want to talk to him now. He said, as you will have learned, an RSVP is an integral part of the planning for an event. So we want to be sure that the students who graduate in the School of Entrepreneurship and Business Innovation, as they become competitive, are going to be competitive, not only in the hard skills, but in the soft skills that sometimes make the difference in whether you get the interview and the job, or whether you get the internship that can lead you to the job. Timeliness, proper dress, which role is your role? You're not allowed to take the food and put it in your pocket, as I've seen students do. Etiquette makes a difference. So let me end there by thanking you for allowing me to share those six candies minutes. Uh, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Or